and all wherever you're watching around uh, the world today on to this evening on this 107th anniversary of the Gallipoli landings quite incredible how quickly that's gone it seems like only yesterday we were there for the the centenary um, so uh, yeah quite incredible but here we are 107 years on and I need no um, second uh, uh, opportunity to speak about this campaign um, I am absolutely passionately obsessed with the Gallipoli campaign, have been for most of my adult life. Uh, in fact, most of my life since I discovered a, an old brass shell case in belonging to my great grand uh, mother uh, that was inscribed uh, to my uncle that fell at Suvla Bay with the 5th Norfolks, the famous vanishing battalion. And I have to say throughout all of that research, I still have more questions and answers right down to what we're going to discuss tonight the initial landings and the first 48 hours and we're going to study this I put this talk together over the last couple of weeks for us so we could get something new we're going to study this through the eyes of two of the allied battalions that landed very different in different theaters but as you'll see um, one of the problems they had in the first two days of the landings uh, were certainly um, similar issues, whether they were at Anzac or whether they're at Helles. Uh, and the battalions I've chosen, uh, the first one, you can see there the badge of the Essex Regiment. We're going to look at the first battalion, the Essex Regiment, part of the 29th Division, uh, who landed on the 25th of April, uh, pretty much uh, in the sort of second wave of landings after the Lancashire Fusiliers, uh, originally planned to be at V Beach, but eventually landed at Lancashire Landing. And also we're going to look at what was happening a bit further up and a little bit earlier, actually, up at Anzac when the 10th Battalion of the AIF uh, landed as part of that initial wave, the 3rd Brigade under Sinclair McLaughlin. And we'll see how they fare over the first 48 hours of the campaign. Uh, but to start with and to give us some context, we need to understand exactly why the Dardanelles and I always talk any Gallip and always start any Gallipoli talk I give by uh, quantifying that firstly I don't think it shortens the war by a day secondly I completely understand that the main enemy needed to be defeated on the main battlefield uh, and that was obviously Germany on the western front and here's the big however I'm not one who subscribes to it being merely a sideshow, uh, Churchill's folly, or any of those sort of excuses, because I'm a firm believer that the Dardanelles is one of the most important seaways, strategical seaways in the world. Alongside the Panama Canal and the Suez Canal, you have the Dardanelles. And actually, given the news today, you know, or, or the year we live in, uh, that's a lot easier to grasp for most people that aren't connected with the Great War than it would have been even a year ago. You can see the map there which shows the Black Sea uh, and the route out through uh, Constantinople or Istanbul as it is now into the Bosphorus and then that narrow Dardanelles as it goes out into the Aegean Sea. This is Russia's only potential ice-free port to get out into open waters. But before there was a Russia, this was always a vitally important seaway. In 480 BC, Xerxes, uh, on his uh, Persian invasion of Greece, crosses by use of a bridge of boats somewhere close to where the Kilit Bar ferry lands today from Chinakali. And then around about 70 years later, coming back the other way, Alexander goes into uh, Turkey from or into Asia from Europe. In fact, it's his last time he steps foot in Europe as he gets onto uh, off the Dardanelles and across into Asia on, on his expeditions as well. And then more recently in the Gallipoli campaign, as uh, recently as 1807, Admiral Duckworth uh, sailed a fleet of the Royal Navy and actually forced his way up through the Dardanelles. And you can see the fortifications there in that painting above not dissimilar to the ones that stand even today at Killet Bar. Uh, it was all going okay, they went quite well, got up there, caused some damage in and around the uh, Bosphorus and uh, certainly shelled uh, some of Constantinople, but on the way back out again the wind dropped and they were able to uh, pass the forts only very slowly and there were a number of casualties and a number of ships were lost on the way out, but nevertheless it told the Royal Navy that there was the chance to force the Dardanelles by use of sea power. 
Now, the ground operations is what we're going to be looking at this evening. And uh, notwithstanding the very important naval battles that took place in from, pretty much from the uh, once the Royal Navy arrived on the outer defences in the back end of 1914, through to their raiding parties in the spring of 15, and then of course the failed attempt to force the Dardanelles on the 18th of March, it was then decided to turn to ground operations, a controversial decision that's still uh, very much debated even today. And we can split those ground operations into the following categories, the Cape Helles landings, the Anzac landings, uh, the four battles for Corfia, and in fact, these little yellow explosions there are showing the areas on the map that uh, they take place. Anzac Heights, the Suvala landings far in the north, the North Anzac lines, of course, the Winter War, and then eventually the evacuation. But for the first 48 hours, the two areas we're going to be looking at is here, where uh, the uh, first Essex land at the base of the, uh, the Dardanelle Straits, the entrance to the Straits there, and at the same time, there was going to be a covering force of Anzacs that were going to land and pinch across that middle ground of the peninsula here. So they can glimpse the Dardanelles and let the Navy try again. And they're going to be entering in around Arri Bernou. And we should point out that at no stage were these ground troops expected to march all their way up, sustain the battle and fight to Constantinople. The idea was to pinch off those fortifications, those defences on the uh, European side of the Dardanelles uh, to enable the Navy to force their way through and get ourselves back on track. As we know now, that never happened at all. To start with, we should look at the 10th Battalion, the AIF. Now, uh, sometimes certainly us Brits seem to think that the Australians were pretty much uh, volunteered and dragged halfway around the world with very little training and thrown into the chaos of war, um, when in fact that's doing them very much an injustice. Uh, what we know is the 10th AIF can actually trace their lineage back to 1854 and the Militia Act across Australia, where South Australia itself raised a number of battalions. This was at a time where there was threat from Russia. Um, uh, it kind of dies away a bit. Some of them disbanded, some of them keep going, the skeleton staff. And then again in 1877, during the Russo-Turkish War, there was another fear of Russian involvement in Australia. Uh, so they were re-raised as battalions. Eventually, in 1903, uh, there's a, a sort of a, a large uh, uh, national or across Australia wide uh, um, reforming of their military militia, and uh, this battalion becomes the 10th Australian Infantry Regiment. And by the time we get to the 11th of August 1914, just five days in, they get the mobilisation orders to fill up their ranks and prepare to train for war. Now, their current building wasn't large enough, so they go off exploring and they find an ideal site near to Morfittville uh, and uh, the race course there, which is where they uh, set up camp, about 34 hectares of camp there, to take on new recruits. And by the 12th of August 1914, so roughly when the First Army Service Corps men are stepping foot in Cali, or sorry, Boulogne and Rouen as part of the initial BF reconnaissance party, uh, Colonel Weir is now put in command of what we would know as the 10th Australian Imperial Forces. This is the chap we're talking about. It's Stanley Price Weir. Uh, he was born in the 1860s um, to Scottish uh, immigrants um, that had moved out to uh, Australia, um, one of the first families in Adelaide, to be fair. Uh, and uh, he enlisted in the militia as early as 1885, the March of 1885. At that stage, they were called the Adelaide Rifles. Uh, he had pretty much unbroken service in the militia. Uh, he had volunteered to go to South Africa, uh, as a number of the uh, uh, Anzacs had fought in South Africa. Um, but he'd volunteered to go. At that stage, they were looking for mounted officers as opposed to infantry officers. So he was uh, overlooked somewhat, but he remained in the militia. And by the time we get to 1914, he's actually a full colonel. When it's decided to really form the 10th Battalion into a recognisable infantry battalion with a formal rank, rank structure, uh, he actually has to step down a rank from colonel to lieutenant colonel to take part. He's over 50 at the time. Actually, I just want you to just look at those mixed bag of uniforms. This is taken in Morfittville. This is probably August, um, maybe early September uh, in 1914. You can see them getting ready for war as such. But look at the amount of different headgear, uniforms, certainly not 
all the same. They're very different to the spick and span photographs we'll see in a moment uh, of the first Essex. Another chap for you to look out is the guy I've, I've um, uh, put a ring around there. Uh, obviously, I've got a personal interest in this guy because this is Sidney Raymond, uh, and he was the uh, signals officer uh, of the uh, 10th AIF, Sidney Raymond Hall. Uh, he was uh, in communications at Civilian Street. Uh, he was very keen on his communications, and he made sure that his signals platoon was recruited entirely from ex-British Army regulars with signaling experience uh, and they above their military training their normal infantry training they would spend most of their evenings uh, trying to communicate by flashlights learning morse code that sort of thing so that they'd be ready for the war and as we find out during the landings the signal platoon of the 10th battalion does exceptionally well it was an ideal choice to join uh, to move to Morfittville and build the camp because several thousand applicants arrived within the first few days now there are only just over a thousand spaces, so they could pick and choose their men. By the time we get to late uh, August, they're inspected by a guy who's, I'm sure many of you are aware of, called Sinclair McLaughlin, uh, who's going to be the brigade commander of uh, third brigade. And he says, I'm more than pleased with the material drafted into my command. They are a good lot of men, deep chested, strong and keen. Many of them still have much to learn in the way of drill but I was particularly impressed with the South Australian quota of the 3rd Brigade and their alertness. And in fact, a number of those early recruits that come through the door uh, from the various militia units uh, locally to join the 10th Battalion um, are uh, particularly exceptional men. Some may not need any introduction at all to you, but this one here, the 31st man to enlist, Private 31, Arthur C. Fourth Blackburn, would go on to be a brigadier by the end of the Second World War. Uh, he would fight uh, extensively throughout the Gallipoli campaign. And again, he crops up a little bit uh, later in the first 24 hours. And he would go on to be awarded the Victoria Cross uh, fighting at Poitiers uh, in the July of 1916 or the August of 1916. Alongside him, just a few hundred back in the queue, Private 405 was Billy McCann. Billy joined as a private and served again throughout the Gallipoli campaign before going on to France. Uh, he would end the war as a lieutenant colonel uh, holding the DSO, the MC and Bar. So these are exceptionally good raw recruits to get enlisted in your battalion. Um, and uh, McCann actually uh, commanded the 10th Battalion. He was the last commander of them in the field uh, in the autumn of, of 1918, so from private to commanding officer. Uh, the pair of them did sterling work post-war in the forming of the Royal Ser or Return Services Leagues in Australia, their version of the, the Royal British Legion, if you like. By the 31st of August, there was 1,023 ranks all ready for overseas service. They'd stepped up, they'd volunteered, they felt they were in a good place. And this made them the first uh, Australian battalion fully committed and able to go overseas. And they didn't have to wait long. Uh, this was the boat that they set off on their journey. Started on the 20th of October because they had to actually uh, leave uh, South Australia and make their way up to uh, Fremantle uh, near to Perth on the West Coast initially. And they're not going to step off that ship until the 6th of December. And it was quite an eventful uh, voyage. They were part of a large uh, uh, fleet of ships coming across at this time. They were all destined for France. They had their British warms. They were, uh, had their cook's guides to visit in London. Lots of them had uh, made contact with family in the UK, saying that they were on their way to visit them when they came over and uh, tourist guides of what they could see when they're in the big city. Uh, the first real bit of excitement for them was actually their uh, destroyer escort, HMS Sydney, um, on the 9th of November, disappeared for sight. This was slightly concerning. Actually, this was the moment that Sydney had been involved in the uh, splotting of the Emden and went off and sunk that German battle cruiser, which was quite significant. In fact, the Sydney was to return. And it was planned to sail past the ships and everyone was going to cheer and cheer and raise their hats in support of what the Sydney had achieved. But in the end, they decided not to do that because there were still some survivors on the Emden, of the Emden on board the Sydney and uh, they weren't in a very good state and the captain felt it was inappropriate to uh, rub their noses in it. Quite incredible, really, isn't it? 
By the 15th of November, they'd reached Sri Lanka, Colombo. And this little um, description of what life was like is exactly, we find this up and down anyone that goes out through the Middle East, whether it be Malta, Sri Lanka, Cyprus, whatever, it's the same scene that they, they, they paint. It says, leave was not granted, although the smell of the place was almost overpowering and the men found the port most interesting. They were amazed at the antics of the natives on the docks as they dived for coins. The weird looking junks, the small boats, the enormous liners and the number of warships certainly impressed us. This probably would have been the first time they realised they were on their way to war. And at this stage, they still believed they were on their way to France. As they left Sri Lanka, actually, on the 20th of November, there was an incident where the uh, Ascansius uh, twice collided with the Shropshire, another vessel uh, in the convoy, twice in the same incident. HMS Hampshire um, actually uh, went alongside and inspected the damage via a searchlight across the bowels, finding a large gash that was well above the waterline. And through a megaphone, the captain of the Hampshire bellowed out, in my whole career, I've never seen anything so careless. You are not fit to be in charge of a ferry boat. Um, actually, after the war, the inquiry took place and both skippers of the uh, and Scansnius and the uh, Shropshire were um, completely uh, found innocent of any problems and uh, were, uh, uh, were exonerated totally. Uh, so it was just a raucous uh, telling off they got. Um, we should point out that in March 1944, this very same ship was um, torpedoed in the English Channel by a U-boat, uh, though they managed to get it back to Liverpool, refit it, and it was still being used as a depot ship during the Normandy Landings. So quite incredible, really, career for this vessel that was made in 1895, I believe it was. It was late November that they finally found out their destination was going to be Egypt, not the UK. This initially was quite um, uh, badly received by the troops on board until their officers point out how lucky they would be to be in amongst the pyramids and seeing this ancient world. And you can see here the famous Mina camp uh, in the foot, you know, sort of uh, the foot of the pyramids. And this is the men of the 10th Battalion uh, with obviously a a local they've brought from home, a wallaby there or a small kangaroo, whichever one it is, uh, as their uh, battalion mascot. And in fact, they would become part of the 3rd Australian Brigade. This consisted of the 9th Queensland Battalion, the 10th South Australians that we're talking about, the 11th Western Australians and the 12th South and West Australians and Tasmanian Battalions. Now, just note that 3rd Brigade, they were all Australian. Uh, the other two brigades in one Anzac division were from New South Wales and um, from Victoria, and it felt that this actually battalion might be better to land first because there would be less kind of rivalry between Victorians and North South Walians that still exists to this day. There's the battle flash that they wore on their uh, for identification as 3rd Brigade, the white square in the black uh, rectangle. And this wonderful painting here that was taken around the same time of them preparing to deploy for the Dardanelles uh, contains two of the principal characters involved. The first one here is Major General William Bridges. He's going to be the, uh, the first Australian divisional commander. Uh, he was part of the North West South Wales contingent that had served in the Boer War uh, as mounted troops. Uh, he was, uh, after the Boer War, he was um, headed up to form the Royal Military Academy at Duntroon. He actually went to West Point, Sandhurst, all around the world to Quetta to study how these things worked uh, before setting up Duntroon. He was, in fact, the first commandant. He would actually die of wounds on the 18th of May 1915 after being hit by a sniper on the, the 15th. And he's actually one of the, if not the only, Anzac from Gallipoli that uh, whose body's repatriated is actually buried uh, in Canberra to this day. Um, the brigade commander that we mentioned earlier is the chap of ring there. This is Brigadier Ewan Sinclair McLaughlin. Uh, he was a Scot that had served in the border regiment in, Wazra, in Wazaristan and also in the Boer War. And he'd first met Bridges, uh, well, he'd met them in South Africa, but uh, he was invited by Bridges to become an instructor at Duntroon uh, whilst on attachment from the British Army. Uh, he enjoyed it so much he stayed and eventually stayed at Duntroon. Uh, and he was to be one of the brigade commanders in the Gallipoli landings for third brigade and one that would actually be relieved due to exhaustion, as we'll find out later, query decision making as early as the 28th of April. However, he would return 
and he would survive the war fighting with the Australian Corps in 1918, where Monash is particularly relied on him uh, and was involved in the crossing of the, well, the uh, over the Rickerval Tunnel there on the 28th of uh, September, breaking of the Hindenburg Line. Um, so uh, quite a key character and is in most actions. Probably his best moment would have been in the defence of Villers Bretno. Before we move on, just wanted to mention this one incident because you wonder about the motivation for the Australian troops, how far they're away. Well, really, it comes here at a place called Broken Hill, if you're not aware of it. Um, Broken Hill actually is just over the border out of uh, Western Australia, uh, sorry, Southern Australia, but a number of the men of the 10th Battalion were actually recruited from this area, Broken Hill. On New Year's Day 1915, so some four months before the Gallipoli landings, uh, around 1,200 men, women and children were on a picnic train that would lead them up to this picnic area. And as they passed the deserted ice cream cart on the right-hand side, they saw, and you can see the cart still there in situ, a Turkish flag fluttering from the top. Now, this was a chap called Ghul Mohammed, who was the ice cream vendor. And uh, along with his colleague Mullah Abdullah, an Afghan butcher, they really felt that the um, Turkish were being hard done by, the Ottomans were being hard done by, saw this as a war on Islam. And so they dug fire pits either side and in an ambush, shot up the train uh, and in fact killed four uh, of the picnickers, seriously wounding seven others uh, before eventually, after a number of hours, uh, the two guys uh, were shot themselves. Um, but this is kind of Australia's first real terrorism incident that occurs prior to the Gallipoli landings. We now just introduce the other battalion I want to talk about, which is the First Essex, and you can see uh, their kit is pretty much on the ball. This photograph is taken uh, in around about 1911, 1910, I believe, maybe 1912. It's taken in India, and uh, we can trace this battalion back to the 1881 Army reforms, where the uh, 44th of foot and the 56th of foot would be combined and out of that we have the 1st Battalion the Essex Regiment. Between 1899 and 1902 they fought in the Boer War. 1902 they were in India, initially at Bangalore, uh, Bangalore. but by 1914 their headquarters was largely in Mauritius and also they had detachments out in Durban. And you can see they're a very smart spick and span unit as this wonderful photo album uh, shows us. They returned to the UK early in 1915 uh, with a number of units, uh, regular units that were serving in far off flung corners of the empire uh, where they would join 88th Brigade of the 29th Division. Uh, this division was um, commanded by Alma Hunter Weston and uh, in their brigade alongside them were the 1st Essex, 4th Worcesters, 2nd Hampshire's and one territorial battalion the 5th Royal Scots. Uh, and they would take part in pretty much everything that happens at Gallipoli, this division. In fact, they would suffer 34 casualties, 44,000 casualties in Gallipoli alone and be awarded 12 Victoria Crosses. It's quite incredible, isn't it? Uh, here's the uh, divisional commander that I mentioned there, Hunter Weston. Um, he'd been in the Boer War in charge of a cavalry uh, column. This is a photograph of him actually in Gallipoli. There's a number of reviews on him. Hay called him a rank, am uh, rank amateur to another staff officer calling him a competent commander. In fact, at Lakato and Ain, he got about uh, uh, his lines uh, on a motorcycle to deliver messages to get an idea. Uh, he wasn't overly convinced by the Gallipoli plan. He actually warned and let home to his wife that hell is there was a lack of maneuverability which you get spurt on and also there'd be a lack of artillery against an entrenched enemy again stuff that uh, all becomes valid when he arrives in Gallipoli. The Essex regiment make their way down on this ship this is the SS Caledonia of the anchor line and um, it actually was a liner plying its trade between Glasgow and New York weekly and in fact it was one of the ships in 1912 that sent an iceberg warning onto the Titanic. Uh, it could carry around 270 horses and 3,000 men, um, and it wasn't to survive the war. In 1916, this was sunk by U-65 just east of Malta in the December. Um, but again, we have some uh, instances of what it was like travelling. This one here from the 21st of March, Lieutenant Colonel Fawcett, the commander of the battalion, said, We assembled at Avonmouth, we boarded six transports. The SS Caledonia had on board HQ five Royal Scots, accompanied the Worcesters and the first Essex, the latter number 
number in just under a thousand. The trip to Alexandria is recorded as being pleasant with regular practice for forming up for an opposed landing. So they did actually train for opposed landings on the boat down there. Uh, there's a couple of um, whinges that always go on when you've got soldiers. I was one, so I know this. Private Staunton uh, of W Company was actually from Sydney, London, South East London. And he said, not happy with being on board ship. We've had rotten grub since we left England. And whilst we do not expect to picnic once we land, we certainly require something to sustain the wants of the inner man. Um, he then goes on to write on Easter Monday when they're at Alexander that they were waking to impart. We have now have to wait until 12 o'clock tomorrow. Let's hope this is true because the troops here are getting fed up, just like what happened in Mauritius. Now, I've been trying to find out what happened in Mauritius, but I suspect there was a little bit of uh, um, uprising there. Uh, and then his final note in his diaries, which I find uh, quite um, moving before the landings, is saying it is 10 p.m. Saturday, April the 24th, and we are steaming into the Dardanelles in company with 37 under other boats. At 4 a.m., our Rivali goes, goodbye now, diary, until some further date. Isn't that incredible? Wrote for his own benefit. It's now in the museum uh, of the Essex Regiment there in Chelmsford. Now, how were the Ottomans going to be defending this position? Well, there's your man, Limon von Sanders, uh, and uh, he'd gone and looked at how the defences were, and he kind of re-establish them somewhat the main division that's going to be defending against both the Anzacs and the British at 29th tradition area are the 9th division uh, they have got the 26 uh, regiment in three battalions in around Helles you can see one two and three they've got the 27th battalion in around uh, Anzac one two and three and then they've got the 25th battalion as their strategic reserve behind Grafia which is to you be used as and when they needed it. Now, why did they have so many reserves here? It's because uh, one of the things Pasha did decide was less emphasis needs to be placed on the water's edge, which are these little defended positions around the beaches. The tactical battle will be won or lost through the launching of decisive concentrated counterattacks within the first 48 hours and how right he was. So without any further ado, let's look what happens at these landers and we start of course uh, up at Anzac Cove now we could talk for an hour and a half about the various theories of why if who landed them in the wrong place uh, it, it, as much as it was confusing for the chaps on board we now know that some of these orders were changed to uh, reflect to land in Ar Ari Banu just 24 hours before the campaign that had not filtered down to the men on board either way it was not the ground they expected what we do know is that actually probably saved quite a few casualties because not only were the Australians not meant to be landing there, but the Ottoman defenders in the heights above, we're not expecting them to land on either side of Anzac Cove uh, either, or Ari Banu either. Uh, the doctor of the 10th Battalion is one of the first uh, ashore. And he says, I don't know what time it was, but the darkness was just fading and I could see men lying around me while others were running about trying to find their platoons or companies. After a few minutes, the crowd on the beach began to thin and the firing ceased. With the exception of a few snipers who were still firing from somewhere along the cliffs to our left, it's probably around about the fisherman's hut or in between there, just down from Walker's Ridge. I looked around for my bearers and collected four of them. It was then light enough to see one's way about and we soon discovered some wounded men lying about on the beach. I dressed these as well as I could with first field dressings and I collected them as well as I could into groups. In fact, what had happened is the that initial three brigade landed had been completely chaotic and the 10th Battalion in particular had landed in the wrong order. This wonderful contemporary photograph shows the landscape as it would have looked as they were coming in. Obviously, it was dark as they made their winds around about four o'clock in the morning. Um, but it shows you it's very much a complex terrain that they are going to be facing. In fact, Arthur Blackburn was one of the first aboard that chap that we mentioned who was awarded a Victoria Cross at Poziers. And he writes that the beach was very rocky and it was not the easiest thing on earth to clamber over big slippery rocks as it is today. All this time bullets were whizzing around us and men were falling here and there. I rushed across the shore to the shelter of a small bank and there shed my pack and fixed my bayonet, then straight on to drive the beggars away. The way our chaps went at it was a sight for the gods. No one attempted to fire. We just went straight up the side of the cliff 
pushing our way through thick scrub, often clambering up the steep sides of the cliff on all fours. And for those of you that have been to Gallipoli, and I'd recommend it if you haven't been, I can't wait to get back there the week after next. If you take away the road that was built to allow the Australians to get to Anzac Cove in great numbers today, and you just take that angle from the shoreline up to those cliffs, you can imagine exactly what they were facing. That initial grasp of Pluggy's Plateau in particular. <coughs> And that was actually um, done by, amongst others, Captain Sidney Hall and the Signalers, who uh, been the first to get ashore once they got onto Turkish soil, realised they needed to become infantrymen first, Signalers second, and they went straight up onto Pluggy's Plateau. Pluggy's Plateau is just behind this photograph we say, see here on the right. This is a contemporary image of Beach Cemetery, as we know it. Pluggy's in the back there, and right up on the top there is probably where Captain Hall was last seen alive. And uh, the account is that he was seen on a small plateau, calmly waving a set of red and yellow flags while bullets sprayed the dirt about his feet. He was killed that afternoon signaling his men commenting that he'd always destined to either win a Victoria Cross or to die in action. And today, uh, Captain Hall's buried uh, in Beach Cemetery is one of the graves I shall be visiting uh, just in a couple of weeks time to pay my respects to a very, very gallant man, soldier and a signaller. Back on the beach and it was quite a chaotic scene. In fact, whilst other brigades were landing now, the actual beach had been secured fairly early on and the men had got up into the foothills and were slowly making their way up towards their objective, which should have been the third ridge. One of the problems we had was General Bridges, the divisional commander, had a fairly remote command position on board HMS Prince of Wales. Now, this was also far offering naval gunfire support, so not the best uh, environment to be uh, using some command and control. Eventually, Bridges lands at around 7.25 in the morning. It's about two and a half hours into the landings at this stage, three hours. He does make his way up to the second reef very briefly. Uh, but then uh, when there's some firing about, is advised to make his way back down onto the beach, and it's from the beach he makes his decision-making. Uh, herein lies one of the first problems. It means that all of the intelligence he's getting about what's happening on the firing line is actually coming from men returning to the beach wounded. And you only have to use your common sense to understand that, you know, if someone's walking back to the beach slightly wounded and a, a general says to you what's happening, very few of them are going to say, well, to be honest, sir, it's OK. There's only a few of us. If you get you know, a few of them, get a load up there and we should be able to break through. It stands to reason that lots of these guys are going to be saying, oh, it's hell on earth. I've been hit. It's terrible up there. What this means is that to all intents, Bridges uh, defers to the brigade commander, Sinclair McLaughlin, uh, who had an equally obscure picture of what was going on and, and decided that the best thing to do was to try and dig in and get a better picture of the situation. Now, this is not what you do on an offensive beach landing, especially when you have an objective. And as a result, we see the first instances of the initiative being lost in the very first hours of the Anzac landings. Um, and, uh, you know, here you see that wonderful then and now of the, uh, the Sphinx, as it was so rightly called, uh, bearing down on you, uh, which is the second ridge we see up on the top there. You can just about uh, see the back towards Walker's Ridge, and then even further inland was the actual true objective. Now, remember, this was a diverse, diversionary or covering force that was meant to be cutting off the Dardanelles so the main landings could take place, the Hellers, and move their way up. Um, what goes wrong with the plan? Well, I mentioned some of it. I think the lack of communications and also the lack of confidence that Sinclair McLaughlin had in, in the own battle plan, certainly when he realised he'd landed in, you know, been landed in what he perceived to be the wrong place, led to a number of misguided decision making in the first few hours. Uh, and what we find is, is actually uh, Third Brigade are dragged into fighting a battle with a few Ottoman troops, as opposed to ignoring them, going around them and pursuing what would have been his geographical objectives as part of a covering force. And the more he gets dragged into that, the more he drags the other brigades who also get into it, strengthening the flanks of the third brigade positions. And by the end of the first day, we start to dig in and consolidate what we've got well short of the third objective. And what this means is within 24 hours, we've shifted the Anzac landings from an offensive to what is effectively a defensive operation. None of which is the fault of the men on the ground who are fighting in these very, very complex terrain. 
there's a map to give you an idea of it. You can see the uh, 10th Battalion as they've made their way up to the south there. There's Ari Banu, Anzac Cove, Hell Spit. And uh, you can see the Gun Ridge here running its way down, which is where they reach at the end of the first 24 hours, whereas their objective was beyond it on this third ridge where they would have been able to sit down and glimpse the Dardanelles. Now, a number of people claim to have glimpsed the Dardanelles. Uh, some of them we think are slightly probably miscalculating what they're looking at. They're looking at a slightly st different stretch of water further to the north. Uh, Arthur Blackburn was certainly among those that gets furthest forward. Uh, and in fact, he was contacted by uh, Charles Bean when they wrote the official history and says, uh, all, and he actually told people at the time, all I've done is supply Dr. Bean at his request with the charts and the descriptions of the course that Phil Robin and I took after leaping from our boats at dawn on April the 25th. I do not know precisely how far we or anyone else went. Well, actually, these are the two men there. Top right is um, uh, Philip uh, de Quiverell Robin, or Robin, uh, who, uh, along with Arthur Blackburn, and there he is, wonderful photograph of him that I did find off of an ancestry site of him as a, as a pensioner in later life. Um, the two of them from their landings made their way as far inland as they could, and they potentially make it to the third objective which however far you see it Charles Bean in the official Australian history will claim so these two men came closer so far as we know to any other soldier of the allies to the objective of the Gallipoli expedition and I'd like to think the two of them may just have glimpsed those narrows for the shortest of time on the initial day's landing but unfortunately there were not enough men uh, with them up on that position and it hands the initiative back to uh, the Ottomans who are able to launch a counterattack and consolidate their own ground and pretty much fix the Anzac on Anzacs on that position we see there along Gun Ridge. Um, sadly for Robin, he was killed just a week later. He's actually on the Lone Pine Memorial and again is one of the names that I often visit. Well, no surprise that we introduce this character into the story really, Mustafa Kemal Bey. Um, who would obviously go on to be the great leader of post-Great War uh, Turkey, the first father of Turkey, uh, Ataturk, Kemal Ataturk. He at the time was in command of the 19th Division, who were very much in the reserve. Uh, and when the 19th Divisional Commander says, oh, I could do one more battalion because I think there's some Anzacs landing, just almost, well, coincidence, is it luck? Is it intelligence? I don't know. But he's actually got the whole of the 57th Regiment who were his finest regiment in his division, there's no doubt about that, Turkish, many of them from local area, uh, in a manoeuvre just behind the third ridge. They're on exercise. So when the call comes to send one of those battalions, that regiment forward, he actually seizes the initiative and he decides to, as ground commander on the spot, almost a version of mission command, to take the whole of that regiment, three battalions, forward to face the Anzacs. And this occurs in that period between some of them get into the third ridge, but not enough of them. So the balance comes back. And this is a classic example in military history of when you use your counterattacks and how you use them. And he does this time and time again throughout the Gallipoli campaign, Mustafa Kemal Bey. And in this case, uh, he uh, is right place, right time, and completely stops any hopes of a breakthrough on the Anzac front. Now, of course, one I would like to focus on is this chap here. This is Lieutenant Robert James Mansfield Hooper. Uh, he's buried in 7th Battalion Parade Grounds, 4th Battalion Parade Grounds Cemetery. And you can see from that bottom photograph what an outstandingly beautiful battlefield this is. There's the cemetery just sat on there coming up the way from Anzac Cove. You can walk all the way up onto that ridge and into the cemetery. And then the top photograph, as it would have looked immediately post-war. And in fact, we can just see there in that back row, I'd say round about here would be Hooper's grave. And the first time I noticed it was because he had a rather strange inscription on it. it said he died like a Britisher. And I'm just going to read you his last letter home, because I think it's so good. It's one they should almost teach in English. And I'm getting old, so I've got to light the letter up with my torch now. So don't appear to look spooky for you on the cameras. But here we go. This is his last letter home to his dad. I've by now learned to take care of myself. And whatever happens, never regret you let me go and simply do or die. And remember, I'm only doing my duty as a soldier is bound to. 
you and I always used to love that verse of Longfellow's, which read, lives of great men will remind us we can make our lives sublime and depart in, leave behind us footprints on the sands of time. If I do not manage to leave any footprints, you can remember you brought up a son of British blood who was not frightened, but took it as an honour to give for his life for his king and his country. Whatever comes, I trust I will not die in any way that would disgrace my country or my friends. Many a noble family will have to suffer loss, so why not take it in the best light possible? Take it as an honour that you helped to pay for the nation's misfortune. Even if I knew I was to meet the most violent death, I would not flinch, but would go ahead. So whatever happens, do not worry and think that I have not got my whole heart in the game. Quite an incredible letter written by a young man in his very early 20s, leading men, some of them 10, 15 years older than him, into the attack. And sadly, late on in the first day, uh, he was caught in a shrapnel barrage and passed away. Uh, and of course, that line about... Uh, bringing up a man of British blood is what's mentioned on that headstone. He died like a Britisher. It's quite a hard, tough cemetery to get to that one, but uh, it's well worth the effort, I can tell you. So now we move on to what was happening at Heller's at the same time. And this wonderful photograph is kind of somewhat coloured in, shows the situation at Lancashire Landing uh, just around about the time the first Essex are landing after the Lancashire Fusiliers have semi cleared the beach they're still coming under fire at this time and in fact this description comes from captain alexander churchill who says we came under fire about a quarter of a mile from the shore about a dozen large rowing boats towed by steam pinnaces came alongside and the company embarked the port side was under fire and five men were hit the view of the beach seemed unappetizing there seemed to be very many men lying about in queer attitudes and lying quietly the boat ran aground after the tow was released in about three feet of water, and we stepped out waist deep. I suppose bullets must have a very drying effect, for I never remember feeling wet at all during the day. A lovely account, isn't it? There's the same scene today. I mean, we like it then and now, really, don't we? But that's how it looked there in 1915, exactly as it looks today. And again, it's very rewarding to walk around there. In fact, um, there's quite low tides apparently at the moment. So a lot of the original infrastructure and docks that you can see running out here, piers have been revealed, which I'm looking forward to seeing. Um, Private Staunton, whose diary is there at Chelmsford, he uh, leaves the following quote in his diary that says, he's the chap, by the way, that said, uh, you know, farewell diary, I'll see you again. And he writes, landed under fire and lost Howard killed. Lost eight or nine killed or wounded in our company. Came through the christening all right, though we were lucky. Some of the inner skillings were cut off and they retreated to our trenches. The Turks advanced within 30 yards, but we swiped them out. I ran across Ward, 1033. He's an inner skilling who deserves the Victoria Cross. He saved our chums under horrible fire. They took one bloke off to the hospital. Well, I was intrigued by that. Um, so uh, I had a quick look and I found the service papers of Michael Ward, 1033. And uh, he was uh, an Irishman that enlisted into the Inner Skillings there. Uh, he joined in Aldershot on the 12th of May, 1911. Uh, he was att attested actually on the 8th of May. Uh, and then you can see um, just a few months later on the 19th of November, he was declared as a deserter. This is in 1912. Uh, and then he came back again uh, a couple of years later. Uh, and it said that he surrendered back at the de depot on arrival from New York. So he obviously joined the army, decided it wasn't for him, uh, deserted, went off to New York, decided that was even worse. And he came back again. And this is the man, I found no other reference to him, but uh, um, in the eyes of Private W. Staunton, deserves the VC. Now, he doesn't, he's not awarded the VC, he's not awarded any decorations from what I can see. Um, he actually fights throughout the Gallipoli campaign and also in France, and is actually invalided out in, uh, I think, early 1917 for wounds received. But, um, and then really that's where the tale goes a bit dead for me. But I just found it fascinating that we could find him from that letter in Chelmsford to actually service records. So what happened to the Essex when they land? Well, originally they were going to be landing at the beach, which you can see 
down just the edge down the bottom here um, but that wasn't going so well at all so they decided to move them around and try and reinforce w beach where at least the lancashire fusiliers were getting a bit of the foot in and it was the right hand edge of lancashire landing that these guys uh, come ashore you can see them x and y companies of the essex regiment now i'm a big fan of this being a signaler that the Essex Regiment always uh, identify their companies by using uh, W, X, Y, and Z companies. If you're a signaler and you're transmitting over the radios, that's a lot easier than A, B, C, and D, three of which all rhyme. So it's one of the reasons why we have W, X, Ray, Yankee, and Zulu companies, because it's a lot easier in clear speech. And there was radio communications being used at both Helles and Anzacs, a little bit more of that later. Colonel Forsett set up his headquarters here, and their immediate objective would be to go forward and capture a number of Turkish riflemen that occupy in Hill 138. By this stage, the um, Lancashire Fusiliers had established a rough beachhead around the contour lines around the top of W Beach, but this was the next objective inland here, 138. In doing this attack, uh, Captain John Coke McMurdo uh, was killed at the head of his men, uh, charging forward, 30-year-old uh, company commander leading his men, and the officer casualties were particularly high uh, across both Anzac and also the uh, British landings here on the first day. Move the story forward to around about 11.30 then, and I think this image here that shows the positions gives you an indication of how chaotic things were uh, at W Beach and at Helles in general. Forces headquarters has moved forward to Hill 138, um, pretty much at the point of bayonet, although at 12.30, Colonel Fawcett does call in some naval gunfire support, which is particularly devastating against hills. Uh, they managed to rush up and take this hill. At 2.15, it is in the hands of the Essex Regiment. But I mentioned that confusion. Look at this. You've got an Essex company, then a Hampshire company, then Essex, then Essex. The Hampshire company is completely out of sync. It just shows you how chaotic this position would be around these fortifications so they kind of get it a bit mixed up and also worthy of mention these chaps down here the fourth worcesters under colonel cayley who charged at bayonet point across from the ruined lighthouse up onto jagezi baba uh, and clearing it of the enemy that enabled the link up between w and v beach which also in ten, in turn enables them to consolidate v beach when to all intents even by the late afternoon v beach could easily have been abandoned uh, and that's pushed back into the sea what was the cost for the essex regiment well 18 dead and 90 wounded here's the view today from the top of hill 138 looking up towards x beach over here in the distance lancashire land in w beach here in these crops this would later in the battle be known as Hunter Western Hill. The trenches and the dugouts still survive on top of it. This is a wartime road constructed by the Royal Engineers that uh, comes ashore here. And this road here leads us to the Wargrave Cemetery at Lancashire Landing, where a number of the Essex men are buried today. And what do I feel were the problems really for the British at Helles with regards to the initiative. Well, firstly, that radio communications with Hamilton broke down very early indeed. This again was similar to the problem we had with bridges. Ian C. Ian Hamilton was actually on the Queen Elizabeth. And when it fired its large shells, its main armament, the vibration, the concussion from the firing of those shells completely destroyed any radio kit that they had, which wasn't reliable. So it meant they were reliant on visual communications with the shore. And with the fog of war, with all the dust and the clouds, it's a very dusty area here, very, very hard to make out. Um, he also had a number of casualties amongst his subordinate commanders on the ground. Uh, and uh, this meant that he was pretty much unable to at any stage affect his battle, affect the battle directly, or in fact, change the plan. When he did get some news that had been a slight breakthrough at Y Beach, where a couple of chaps had wandered straight into almost up to the uh, edge of Criffia and come back and said, oh, there's a chance here. Uh, even though he advised Hunter Weston that that might be worth pursuing, in effect, he said, look, you're the divisional commander. What do you think? And Hunter Weston came up with a fairly sound tactical reason not to attack. But again, this may have been an opportunity uh, that was that was lost. So age-old problems of communications.
And of course, it's not only your own problems of your own doing, it's who you're facing. And in this case, the ninth division, as I mentioned before, were commanded by Halil Sami. You can see there on the left. Uh, and his 27th regiment in and around Helles were able to just hold the beaches long enough. And that means long enough for the reserves, and remember Von Sanders talked about these counterattack capabilities, to get those reserves up in a position where they could not only reinforce the areas around V Beach and W Beach or pull him back towards Hunter Western Hill, but more importantly, plug that gap at Y Beach so that within a few hours, the troops that had landed there fairly much unopposed were suddenly facing far greater numbers and that balance had swung against them had they been able to pursue and occupy Kafir, uh within the first few hours they may well have caught a number of commanders because there was a divisional command base there in Kafir at the time uh, and uh, you know they were certainly with the uh, ottoman turkish troops would not have been happy with the enemy now behind them as well if there's a criticism of this chap it's that he did delay his last counterattack until half past six in the afternoon and in doing so potentially lost the chance of throwing the Allies back into the water. Uh, it meant that Hunter Weston was able to consolidate that beach uh, head. The Turks were able to fall back to the new Eski line further inland, and it meant the Allies had consolidated their positions and were there for the long term, certainly for the next few months. One of the Essex casualties I should mention here, Arthur Dorney, you can see quite a talented amateur boxer, regimental boxer, Essex man, came from Canning Town, Star Road, house is still there, there you see it, typical Mr Ben house as I call it, a two up, two down, but many of my relatives lived in those sorts of houses in South East London, um, love it, worth a few quid today, no doubt. Um, he was killed on the first day, he'd recently got married, we find his wife, uh, I think with one small child on the census, uh, at the end of the war, uh, living back with her mother. Um, a particularly poignant because he's on the Hellas Memorial, which is that magnificent honeycomb, honeystoned memorial that looks out over the Dardanelles, deliberately placed there actually, so that uh, Parshian ships could, we weren't sure what the political situation was going to be like in Turkey in the 1920s and what access to the battlefields would be like. So the idea was the Hellas Memorial was one that as you sail by on a cruise ship, you'd be able to toss a a sort of poppy reef over the side and let it drift in towards where your relative was named. It's quite poetic in many ways. Um, and, and there's no doubt that Mr. Dorney was killed very close to where his name's commemorated. And you don't often see that. I had one incident of it in uh, Salonica a couple of weeks ago there where there was a group where you could stand, read the name and see the point where the guy fell. And you get it here, but you don't, don't get it very often. There's not many men on many gate are killed within sight of it. And same probably with Teetval. Um, so, yeah, very special. And another chap I'll be thinking of when I'm there shortly. For the Essex Regiment, this is the area that they move into. And the reason I wanted to show you this trench map is because this is pretty much it from April through to the eventual evacuation. The nature of gullies and trench lines. And you can see there are various trenches that actually refer to the men that, uh, that built the trenches. Up to the top here, you can see Chelmsford Street. Essex Knoll, you've got Worcester Flats done by the 4th Worcesters, um, Fusilier Street, Lancashire Street, obviously the Lancashire Fusiliers involved in this. And then as we move over with 42nd East Lancs Division come ashore, we have Ard Ardwick Green, Oldham Road, Wigan Road, Renfield Street. And then just across, we get a bit further over to where the Royal Naval Division were serving and you see Plymouth Avenue, uh, there's Nelson Avenue and the likes. So you can always pick out the troops. But the reason I wanted to show you this mainly is because we've now lost that initiative and we've effectively created a small Western Front on a very small peninsula where there is no manoeuvrability. There's no opportunity to generate force. And the stalemate here is going to come a lot quicker than it's going to come anywhere on the Western Front. And pretty much after those 48 hours, uh, without massive investment in resources, men and material, which we just simply don't have at this stage of the war, this is always destined for failure. And in fact, by early May, the battalion commander of the 1st Essex himself, Lieutenant Colonel Fawcett, is killed. And um, Captain, Captain Pepe's Peep, sorry, mentions on the 2nd of May, by a gallant and timely bayonet charge, the Essex were able to restore the line 
while the raw Scots dealt with the Turks that had broken through. So right through to early May, there was continual counterattacks by the Turks trying to push us back. Um, and Private Staunton, that chap whose diary I've been reading, he mentions that uh, just returned from two bayonet charges. We were out all night, and when we started, we stopped opposite the Turkish snipers at point blank range. Our colonel was wounded, and I went to help him, and I saw their sniper. I had another chap's rifle with me with one round. He shot one dead, and then he pumped a round into my valise, valise, and the contents were torn to pieces. Now, the incident he's talking about there appears probably around there, Essex and Old Chelmsford Street, that I've ringed. And it's quite uh, telling, because this is where Lieutenant Colonel Godfrey Fawcett uh, from St Albans in Hertfordshire held the DSO. 49-year-old battalion commander would eventually die of the wounds he received uh, earlier that morning. And uh, the Essex history itself says that uh, including the dead was Lieutenant Colonel Fawcett. Uh, the assault had um, uh, pretty much uh, vanished into one where there was lots of trouble locating the various objectives for the battalion. And then they heard a voice asking what unit they were from. And when they informed them they were the Essex Regiment, they were told to come forward, at which time he was mortally wounded, dying an hour later. Major Summer and Lieutenant Dixon were killed the same way. The challenge and the invitation apparently came from a German officer. So Major Barlow assumed command of the battalion. So very intriguing, loss of life there. A German calling them out by name. And you've got this lovely account in the local press of how the the Essex were ambushed in this instant you know with cries of who are you with the Essex right come on Essex and they go so forward a few paces before they're shot uh, the colonel was shot and all of this if you look at this wonderful account it comes from our man again look private Staunton the chap whose diary obviously wrote the story to the press as well um but yeah very very sad loss uh, and he's buried there in Redoubt Cemetery Another one uh, that I will just mention because it's one of my favourite stories of the Gallipoli campaign and I have got three or four minutes uh, before we get to the tail end of it but I wanted to read this account. This is a chap called RSM Hare and perhaps the most brilliant book on the Gallipoli campaign in my mind is Make Me a Soldier by Ar Arthur Berend. He was an East Lanks officer attached to the First Essex as part of the reinforcements and the man he went to meet was this chap RSM Hare and it's one of it's just beautifully written book. And I'll rattle through this for you to give you a description of how he first arrives with the Essex Regiment on a patrol. As we stole along the lane, I noticed a certain smell. Our pace grew slower and slower, the smell stronger and stronger. God, mad, muttered the guides, holding his nose in the ditch, like some pantomime creature, their monstrous object with white staring eyes, a huge bladder-like body, and absurdly small legs stretched helplessly across our path. It was a dead mule. Gasps, groans and ribald curses exploded from the men as they filed slowly past. And then this most inopportune of places, our guide paused and gazed uncertainly across the moonlit meadows. I'll just nip over there and see where we are, sir, he said, pointing to a distant brow. We sank dismally into the mud and waited. We were still waiting when a whispered message was passed along to me with a following wave of chuckles. Sergeant Blackburn is halting alongside the mule and wishes to know if he may smoke. I must have fallen asleep because the next thing I remember was the guide tapping me on the shoulder and saying, only 300 yards more, sir, across a couple of fields. We'd better get a double on or they'll get a machine gun on us. A helter-skelter rush across the grass followed. And then the guide shouted, here we are, sir, look out, as a trench gaped to our feet. We jumped in. We poured in after him amid showers of earth. There was an angry outcry burst with several sleepers in the trench bomb. Who the hell are you? This is no bloody way to land in a trench. Why can't you come down the communication trench like effing gentlemen? This way, sir, murmured the guide. And pressing us along the trench, we followed him over 100 yards, leaving a cursing trail of waking sleepers behind us. Mr. Eyre, captain of Z Company, whispered, halting outside a dugout. He went in and he said, number 13, platoon detail arrived, sir. Is there an officer? Said a tired voice. Yes, sir. Ask him to come in. I went in. Good evening, said Eyre. Have all your men arrived safely? Yes, sir. Well, as I expect they're getting pretty weary, that they can turn in till morning. Come along with me. I'll show you where to put them. I followed him down the trench. Sort them out along here. This is only the second line, so you needn't worry about being slaughtered in your sleep. Good night. May the 27th. 
In the stiff cold hours of the breaking dawn, I was roused from a refreshing if angular sleep by growls of stand to, and we peered over the parapet until the scores of creeping Turks resolved themselves into bushes, and we could see the first line trench a few hundred yards in front. Soon the scent of frying bacon mingled with the equally pleasant smell of burning wood. Air sent his orderly to come to his dugout with a notebook he asked me to bring, and I set off down the trench. Where's Captain Air's dugout? I asked the company sergeant major. He shot a searching glance at me. Here you are, sir, around the corner. I went round the corner. I entered a big roofless dugout. Air was sitting on the floor with a canvas sunshade made out of a Mark 7 bandolier tied round the back of his field service cap. By the way, he said dryly, my name is Hare, not Air. And the two of them would strike up an amazing relationship. In fact, Captain Hare would recommend Berend for the military cross later on, uh, a few weeks later for a reconnaissance patrol. But unfortunately, Hare himself was killed and he's buried in 12 Tree Cop Cemetery. And that's another chap that I must visit in a few weeks' time. So let's look at the cost for just these two battalions in particular, and it's remarkably similar. Similar, you can see there the Tenth Australian Imperial Force, those Western uh, Southern Australians there, mainly from Adelaide and a few from Broken Hill, suffered 466 men killed, wounded, or missing by early May of 1915, and for the First Essex Regiment, just two men more, 468 men killed, wounded, or missing during that same period. That's roughly 50% casualties, but both of them lose 70% of their officers. Gallipoli was no doubt an attritional war, and it was one that would uh, uh, continue right through to the evacuation. And of course, the evacuation is what most of us remember as being the successful part of that, and the troops came back. But is it the end? Can we just say that the Gallipoli campaign was a waste, a failed enterprise, a failed episode that brought uh, nothing from it? Well, you know, there are arguments on both sides of that. But what I would say, it's not the end for these two battalions. And in fact, it's not the end for their brigades or their divisions, because <clears throat> they do recuperate from this. They do fight back on the Western Front. And there's a great case to argue that in the last 100 days, the advance to victory that we talk about so, so fondly as being the time that uh, the Allies rightly win the war on the Western Front, the Australian Corps, 29th Division, the 42nd East Lancashire Division, the 52nd Lowland Division, the New Zealand Division, and the Royal Naval Division, all Gallipoli men, play a key part in that eventual victory. So it's the end of the campaign for these chaps, but it's not the end of the war. And with that, David, I think I'll invite you on and take any questions. Hi, that was absolutely superb. We've had you several times on these webinars and, and uh, each time you, you, you find a new height and, and, and I think that was absolutely superb. Ladies and gentlemen, if you'd like to uh, send your appreciation, appreciation to Clive by uh, raising your hands in the usual manner, uh, just press the uh, raise hand button on, on Zoom and Clive can tell you that uh, there's a, a very loud virtual round of applause. Unfortunately, you can't hear it, but I can confirm that there's a, uh, people have clearly enjoyed that as much as I have. Um, it's question and answer time, so... Um, well, I can see a couple there that have come up in the questions box. If you, you want me to answer those ones first, David. Yeah, well, so, yeah, but, but by all means, before, before you do, I just, I, what we've got here is uh, one of the Western Front Association's pension record cards for okay. Alfred Dorney, the, the, the chap that you mentioned there, which... Uh, yeah, is, wow. Uh, of of some uh, some some interest to suspect um, yeah for 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 for, for, um, for for but also let me just um, kill my and that's the right I got the right address then didn't I Star Lane Canning Town yeah. uh, Michael yeah. Michael Ward I want to just um, show you Michael Ward um, okay so um, if anybody's not sure what we're talking about here these are the pension record cards that the WFA saved some time ago. Oh, okay. And, so, um, and he was from Londonderry. Okay. Look, look at his disability. Oh, confusional insanity. Wow. Is that what was he was discharged from then? Uh, yeah, disability. Well, it, 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 that's the, the basis on which he got his pension. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, Blimey. so uh, that's uh, they're incredible, aren't they? It, it is uh, of of some some uh, some, some interest. Uh, and the last one again is another one for for uh, uh, Michael Ward, which um, I just. Uh, quickly share share with you um whilst we're waiting for questions to to arrive um 
There we go. He's got an address in Edinburgh. Yeah. Uh, right. Yeah, that's that. That's all. I just uh, I, I want to. So requisition by Ulster Region man residing in Londonderry. Yeah. yeah it's Strange, good. isn't it? Yeah. 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 Anyway, okay. we'll, we'll not we'll not matter on about the pension card, but yeah, let's, <laughs> let's, uh, let's field a couple of questions that we've got already. So, so David Martin asks, what is your opinion? What is your opinion of the analysis of Chris Roberts through the Anzac landing? Namely, mm -hmm. it was practically unopposed uh, by Turks, about yeah. 130, 140 defenders at most. So, um, yeah, um, well, those numbers are absolutely right, actually. Uh, and I've got a lot of time for Chris. He's a lovely guy, um, and. Uh, He's a military man himself of some quite experience. Uh, so um, uh, I try and grab him for a coffee whenever I'm in uh, Canberra to have a chat about it. There is a number of suggestions in most contemporary uh, books of the Anzacs coming under machine gun fire, yet those machine guns don't appear on the order of battle as such. What we do know is that there are some heavy weapons taken off of the uh, uh, and crews. Uh, that come as part of the Goblin and the Breslau, uh, German machine gun advisors, effectively. And they're firing from either way back across the ridge. But 140 defenders at rifle range around Anzac Cove is probably enough to pin you down. That's the problem. So that's why they need to get off the beach fairly quickly. Um, when it was practically unopposed, yeah, I mean, numbers-wise, the Anzacs do manage to get, I think it's around about 11,000 men ashore by the end of the first day. And at one stage, that would have been up against 140 men that were actually being attrited by the initial Anzacs getting up there. So they were degrading that amount, you know, as they make their way up to the second ridge. The problem is the hesitancy, um, probably by Sinclair McLaughlin, in not pursuing it and saying, let's go, let's go, reinforce success, as opposed to digging in, means that balance soon shifts. And when Ataturk arrives with the 57th Regiment, that 140 soon moves to around about 4,000 and that's just simply not enough. You cannot move 4,000 men with 11,000 in that complex terrain. So that opportunity is gone. Uh, so yeah, unopposed, uh, practically unopposed at the top. If you're a member of the 7th Battalion drifting in, taking in enfilade fire from the Fisherman's Hut, you'd uh, your casualty figures would dispute that because uh, they lost quite a lot of men coming in on the sort of left flank of the Anzac land as they fired directly from the Fisherman's Hut. But certainly the 10th Battalion were not interfered with too much in the early phase of the landings. The problem is command and control means it breaks down into small unit actions of sections and platoons. So hopefully that's uh, answered that for you. So that's that's great. Thanks for that, Clive. Um, we have got uh, another question. I'm just trying desperately to get uh, the question on, onto, the, onto the Zoom call, but unfortunately that's not proven possible. So that's all right. So we'll just read out um, yeah, Smith's uh, Question, which is, thanks, Clive, that was terrific. Do you think that any different tactic uh, in this campaign could uh, would have been able oh. to be won? Was it Do all you know, It's just, I, I, I personally feel it could never have succeeded. Um, I just think it was, it, the, the terrain doesn't lend itself to what we were trying to achieve. Um, I mean, you could have hypothetical scenarios about advancing, the, you know, landing in 1917 with weaponry had there. Would that have been different, I suppose? Um, but um, what I do know is that given the world as it was in 19, late 14, early 15, when we come up with a plan, and given our own capabilities as an army then, not what we become, despite the fact it could never really have succeeded, I'd probably have done it again. I probably would do it again. I, I don't see the solution to this by sending those five divisions onto the Western Front because in 1915, we're not having it our way there either on the Western Front, are we? There's not a lot of brilliance being displayed, really, at, uh, at Obers Ridge and Lewes and, and places like that. We just haven't matured enough as a, as a force to make a real difference. So, yeah, it's an immortal gamble, as one of the naval memoirs puts it, and it's exactly that. I don't know the answers. I don't think it could have succeeded, but I'd probably do it again. Sure, that's um, yeah, fair, 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 fair comment, Clive. Um, we've got another question. We've got several questions. Well, we've got one more question from Seamus. Oh yeah, yeah, that's a good, great um, question. And, and good question. Unfortunately, I can't. Once again, I can't get Seamus to join us on the Zoom. 
I don't know if everybody's shy tonight, but uh, so what Seamus is asking is, is there anything positive that came out from the yeah. campaign that benefited the Allies in the longer term? Yeah, I most believe his, so. Most historians appear to consider it a bit of a waste of lives and resources. So yeah. uh, what, what do you say to that? Yeah, no, I, no, I, I mean, I, I know Stephen Chambers would agree with this, and obviously we don't want to be pigeonholed as being Easterners because we're not. You know, that's I say again, the war can only be won on the Western Front. Um, but, you know, it is what it is. And what do we have from Gallipoli? Well, I think some modern historians are starting to change their views ever so slightly. Uh, Gary Sheffield, I know, has started to pick up on a number of the tactical operational advances that come out of the Gallipoli campaign, quite rightly, that, um, you know, we have. And amongst those, I would include uh, the idea of um, uh, used in... Uh, mass banks of machine guns long before the machine guns were uh, taken out of battalion and put as a single battalion of machine gunners we were banking machine guns here at Gallipoli to make up for the lack of artillery fire support uh, the other one is the Royal Navy Division at Crafia in their operations there in June 1915 start to use the term bite and hold along before it's used on the western front again because of the lack of resources they need to adapt their plane all these things are pointing to the one key thing that Gallipoli gives us it's initiative and if you look at the divisions that fight in Gallipoli and where they are in 1918 that initiative that spree of course still exists I think without the Gallipoli experience they might not have the bags of initiative that they show in the success not only there but you could also say those that go on to the Palestine campaign as well uh, so yeah initiative is the big thing Thanks for that, Clive. Right. I'll just dive in just to Facebook, just to grab a question out of the Facebook uh, watchers that are, are on the call here. And David Clark um, asks this. Um, Am I right in saying that there were higher casualties in the UK ranks as compared to the Anzac troops? Um, <clears throat> yeah, it's a difficult one, isn't it? It's, it's, the answer is yes, because it's more of us. Um, and it, it's, it's hard on Anzac Day today where you know you're watching your own six o'clock news and your own BBC news channel is talking about remembering the Australians at Westminster Abbey or St Paul's Cathedral with little attention to our own men that serve there and that's that's not the fault of Australians mm. it's just sometimes you know unless you live in Bury or Lanc Lancashire where they still suffer you know still celebrate or commemorate is the right word uh, Anzac Day I still do I put a sprig of rosemary in my lapel today as I'm going about, as all Gallipoli people do, because the campaign's pretty poppy. Um, but uh, it's the, the, all the casualties are are uh, significant, significantly high. But you've got to remember that you know there's 20,000 names on the Hellas Memorial. The vast majority of those are, are British names. There's 400,000 Brits involved in total. I think is it 60,000 casualties British and. I'm going to say 6,000 Australian, or is that maybe I'm underdoing them? I don't want to. So. Of course, the French. The French. the French. The French suffer more casualties than, than, than the Australians. Yeah, I mean, if, if we get chance and you get me back to do my 500 Cockney War stories, David, at some stage in the future, the serious point to that is London's, London's contribu contribution to the Great War is larger than Canada's and larger than Australia's as a city. So we should not underestimate our own contributions as a nation wherever we're from in this country we do our bit and Gallipoli uh, yeah sometimes Gallipoli we we tend to overlook um but I guess by then we'd already fought at Mons Lucato the Aisne first deeps you know and uh, so there are other battles we look to sure um Michael Phipps Michael Michael yeah how, how are we doing, Michael? Thanks, David. Yeah, good, thanks. Clive, that was fantastic. Uh, really uh, fascinating. And uh, obviously disappointed I'm not going to be with you in a couple of weeks. I'll yeah, to go next shame, year instead. Shame. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. But, uh, I mean, I have been in the past. But um, I'm just wondering, uh, how good was the intel on the Turkish dispositions on that first day around those beaches? And where did that intel come from if we yeah. had it <clears throat> it wasn't good enough i mean most of our intelligence came from uh, a lot of the um the, the people nomadic farmers in the area were of greek origin which are supposedly quite friendly so we did have a, a sort of a network of intelligence where we were you know landing greeks onto the island to try and work out exactly what was happening on the peninsula and that that was being sent back to imbros the rest was from visual observing from shore 
Uh, and also we had Royal Naval Air Service that would be doing the odd flight over on reconnaissance. It was fairly accurate in the amount of numbers, but what we do is we completely underestimate the uh, the Ottoman capability to defend their own homeland. Okay, so we're basically we're we're baking basing the uh, Ottoman M army and the Turkish soldiers in particular in how they they fared both in the Caucasus mountains against the Russians and, and uh, notably at the uh, Suez Canal where they attacked the 42nd East Lanks Division, remember, a, a bit earlier. Didn't go so well. Um, but as anyone that will tell you that fought in the Second World War, Germans defended France uh, are slightly more stiff resistance when they're defending the other side of the Rhine in their own country. And we should have taken that into consideration. And perhaps the man that understood that most of all um, is Doughty Wiley, who really understood how the Ottoman Empire worked. And instead of having him as an intelligence officer assisting us, you know, gets himself killed on the, the second day, awarded a Victoria Cross, charging up towards the, you know, the, the back of uh, um, Saddleby Air Fort. So we lose our best man from intelligence purposes yeah 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 over it's overestimating our own ability and underestimating the enemy that sounds okay. familiar doesn't it with the current current global situation just a bit yeah thank you yeah Th thanks michael for your question i appreciate it um so uh, before we go on to um further um uh, questions um i've got uh, something from andy johnson you, you remember the pension record card for uh, our friend ward um, 75 <clears throat> Grass Market, Edinburgh, um, the, the chap who, who uh, was uh, um, mentioned in Clive's talk, um, Andy said this about 75 Grass Market, Edinburgh. In the 1870s, Castle Trades Hotel opened at this address as a lodging house with room for 327 men in the 100 tiny wooden cubicles on each of its three floors. Each mm. cubicle, 28 feet in area, contained nothing more than a single bed and a nail on the door where the men could hang their belongings. So a rough mm. existence for, 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 for a private, private ward, um, was it ward? Um, yeah. Yeah, yeah Michael, private. yeah, yeah. Yeah. So thanks for that yep. info, Andy. Right, uh, a couple more questions. Uh, Kit yeah. Reed says, uh, no camera, but uh, were the lessons learned at Gallipoli useful for World War II? <clears throat> Yeah, well, that's a good question, isn't it? Because sometimes it's cited that um, the, you know, Normandy land is, is is the next occasion, but of course that's not true. I mean, the, you know, Dieppe is probably the next occasion we have an opposed landing, I think, and then you have Operation Torch and these sort of things. So I think by the time we get to Normandy, we've got other examples, notably Sicily, Italy, those sort of things to compare to the landings for. Um, but uh, generally, there's some things you can learn. Uh, the the big, best comparison with Gallipoli may well be the Falklands, with regards to size of force, size of opposition, and logistical, you know, uh, um, scenarios that we have. So it'd be interesting to know if they uh, in the Falklands they looked at Gallipoli and studied what went right and what went wrong. A lot more goes wrong than right. Um, and uh, that's why I'm hoping you're going, you are going to ask me, uh, you know, the question by John, because I don't want to shy away from it. I think it's a really good question, John Salmon, and a point he makes. Uh, John, uh, John, yeah. John Salmon's the next question up, so let's go yeah. straight into that. Unfortunately, I can't get John onto yes. the Zoom. I don't know what's going on tonight, but never oh. mind. John, John Salmon has asked Clive the following question. No mm. matter how important to see where the Dardanelles might be, do you not accept that it was a major military blunder to commit troops to a campaign for which they were inadequately, if at mm. all, properly trained, yeah. uh, which could never be underpinned with the required logistical support and one where all elements of surprise had long since been lost, thanks to the Royal Navy. Uh, so, longish question there. But, no, 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 it's, it's really, you know, it's a really valid point, and it's obviously, the, you know, John's uh, feelings there, and I completely understand that, and as I said at the beginning, it doesn't shorten the war by the day, it's no chance of, 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 of um, I don't believe they had any chance of success. The only thing I would say uh, to consider about that is, were those men adequately trained, if at all, to go to the Western Front where they'd been sent, where they'd probably been killed in higher numbers and quicker by the Germans? That's the only thing I'm saying. It's an immortal gamble. And a lot of this gambling is playing with sons' lives. You know, I've got a lad who's recently just filled out his forms for Sanders, so I'm not taking these things lightly, you know, 
there's risks people's like people are going to get telegrams through their door including my own family as a result of the Gallipoli campaign I'm not as prepared to go as far as say it was just a sheer military blunder that shouldn't have happened because the pressure on us as a nation to be doing something at this stage of the great war we couldn't do nothing you know Russia's crying out for us to get more involved France is crying out for us to get more involved and I don't think it would have helped at all by sending those Australians or anyone else into uh, France at that stage. I think they would have just been eaten up by the whole industrial warfare that we're witnessing in France. So it was a calculated risk and it was one that absolutely failed. So, yeah, of course, it's a blunder. We, it's, the, the, the Gallipoli campaign is a failure. We end up losing. You know, we end up leaving with our tails between our, our legs. We end up re-embarking onto uh, the same positions at the end of the war when we eventually defeat the Ottomans. But other than not doing anything, I'm not sure what the solution is. So, you know, I hope, I'm trying to play it with a straight bat. And I hope hopefully that's, uh, that's a fair enough way of answering it. Yeah, th thanks, Matt. Matt, I want to just dive into Facebook again for another question uh, from um, um, Facebook from Murray Priscott. Uh, had we had aircraft operating, could there have been better use of, of naval bombardment against Turkish strong points? So there's, there's two parts to that question. The mm. first part, had we had aircraft operating, etc. So um, yeah, um, I think the part of the problem is the the Turkish forts that were causing the problems for the Royal Navy. And uh, in fact, I would just mention to John because the last part of his question, which is quite right, is I believe the Royal Navy should have gone again on the 19th of March, and I think if Roger Keyes had not been sent off to rescue an ailing battleship and had been in the wardroom with de Rubek, he would have probably said, no, we are going the next day and we might have had a different outcome. Um, but we didn't. And so we lost the element of surprise. But that notwithstanding that, you know, the, mo the main threat to the Royal Navy uh, from the forts was not so much the static forts, it was the mobile batteries identifying the mobile batteries and a lot of the raids and we had a chat about kipper robinson if you remember last year david we talked about his victoria cross up at kumkali um and uh, you know that was to take out one of these mobile forts mobile batteries that was causing so much problem and naval gunfire support is flat trajectory and it's kind of not what you need to fire against individual targets like that you need you need mortars you need you know stuff that can lob things not far enough flat trajectory so um with regards to the aerial spotting capability at that time perhaps just perhaps gallipoli comes at the wrong stage in the war you know had this been 1917 we would have had those capabilities Our capable aircraft what, 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 what were what were they in 1915 you know they're not they're not even flying from ships they're flying from you know islands like rabbit island and what have you and uh, so uh, you know they haven't even got a lot of capability of flying over the peninsula for too long they haven't got that, that length of being able to operate in the skies certainly not much in the way of payloading for dropping anything on anybody's head either yeah no not at all now yeah. I'm, I'm not aware of any bombing taking place actually by the British there we certainly a bit later in the campaign we do when we go over and try and bomb some of the um, Balkan railway lines don't we there's a Victoria cross there right um, yeah. there's not many more questions there we've got one on we've had we've covered intelligence before so Philip's question you might have more or less mm. touched on had the British and Anzac intelligence underestimated yes. the striking quality of the Ottoman for forces yes. and the influence of the German organisation. Yes, uh, and even today, 107 years on, historians are underestimating the influence of the German organisation and armaments. You know, we've got um, uh, 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 Stefan Nussbaum's coming with us to Gallipoli and, uh, you know, he's a German and, uh, you know, some of the research coming out of Germany now about the amount of German involvement. I think we've got up to over 500 German officers that are on the ground, you know, instructing and uh, assisting. Um, so yeah, very, very important. Very mm. important. Um, and and uh, I'll, I'll, I'll boil you this one over so you can have a full, full go at uh, answering it, uh, uh, Clive. Uh, Andrew Melton has asked if, you, if uh, going over Anzac Day would be a good time to go over, but uh, I yeah. think Clive does visit quite often with... Uh, yeah. It's, and take to take to, you take tours over the climb so um yeah now andrew if you if you are australian new zealander i would say then absolutely it's time to go is anzac day um for you because you get a lot from it i'd say if you're not australian new zealander 
kick it back a few weeks so there's less people you get the battlefield to yourself there's nothing like walking Gallipoli and feeling the only people there uh, and even when it gets quite hot I'd say you know in August um, a good place it's a good time to go and, and look up at Suvla Bay and just uh, you have the place entirely to yourself yeah um, so that's when I'd go I'd avoid April if you could and go in May Thanks for that. We'll, we'll probably 22 minutes past. We've just got time for probably one or two more questions. Right, I can Matt, I can see John was from Sandhurst himself. He's now. I hope I wasn't. His, I was an instructor in the signal swing there. So, <laughs> so yeah. Well, there we are. We we he's got, he's got a military head when he looks at it. So good stuff. Right, Carol King has asked the following. I, I, I've stopped trying to invite people up onto the onto the <laughs> Zoom now. So I'm just going to read the question out from Carol King. I am researching the Devonshires who were arrived later in 1915. It seems that most of the casualties then were suffering from frostbite and rheumatism as the trenches were underwater and freezing. And mm. the accounts sent back seem to indicate that there was still a lack of organisation and communication. Mm. Was this true or just the understanding of, of, of those there? So there's two parts to the question, one about the, the freezing and one about the lack of communication and, and, and organisation. Yeah, I mean, the conditions turn and uh, the, the, the last chance to try and make anything of the Gallipoli campaign to my mind was 21st of August when we have the reinforcements to try and capture Simita Hill and the moment that fails it's actually the largest battle of the Gallipoli campaign is the fight it's Green Hill Simita Hill in the uh, 21st of August when that fails that's when we should have been looking to leave we we stay too long the, the weather turns and as you know you lose a lot of people through frostbite and the storms are literally you know blow the trenches away um now with regards to lack of organization i think there's just a general lack of morale at that stage and suvla bay in particular had been you know was very well invested in with regards to infrastructure there was major port facilities there for uh, for the gallipoli campaign it was quite extensive but it was clear that you know, the, the the future of the war was not in the Dardanelles. Uh, we were starting to draw back. The reinforcements were getting less and less. The supplies were getting less and less. And I think everyone from top to bottom knew it was coming to an end, of which it did. So I guess that's a Devon Yeomanry that um, is being studied there. I've, there's some, uh, you should really look up a guy called uh, Edward Hain, uh, who's buried in, in uh, Hill 10 Cemetery who is the son of a shipping magnet and it's a particularly tragic story of his loss and how his father commits suicide really or dies of a nervous breakdown I think after losing his son a year earlier um, and that shipping company that they owned in various guises actually its last guise was P&O Ferries so uh, <laughs> to bring it bring in bring it up to to the modern world yeah yeah Okay, so um, somebody's asked about uh, Clive's tours, and um, in answer to that question, it's Battle Honours. Uh, just Google that, or send an email in, and I'll send you a link to uh, to Clive's company. Uh, that was addressed to Martin, who asked that question. Um, so I think we're more or less. Um, the, uh, what time? Is it? Twenty-five minutes. Uh, very, very quickly, I'm going to yeah. just uh, invite you to answer Brian Matthews's question there. What would have what would what would have success looked like? That's a good question. That's a great question, is it? Because that's a brilliant question. Um, so if we were going to say it all goes right on the day, uh, the first thing is the unachievable objective. There is no way the 29th Division are going to be able to capture uh, Achi Baba on the first day. Um, that wouldn't have happened unless the Ottoman defences had completely crumbled. So success to me would have looked like the Royal Navy going again on the 19th of March and forcing the Dardanelles uh, and then um, uh, us landing troops and occupying those forts to secure them and fighting a largely defensive action for the rest of the war until either Constantinople falls or the Ottomans are knocked out. That's what it would have looked like. Um, and of course, what eventually would have undone all that is the moment that the rail, the Germans build that unbroken railway from Berlin to Constantinople, then sea power becomes irrelevant because they can bring everything overland. Uh, so success would have only looked like two and a half years anyway and then you know the German capacity to to resupply the uh, Ottomans with the latest weaponry probably would have shifted back in their favour. It might not need it two and a half years it might be yeah. just um, it'd be, if, if everything had gone right perhaps. To the yeah I, and we only again David we only look at you know if we'd captured the peninsula side you know there's still forts on the Asian side 
Yeah. So they would have had to have landed at Kumkali. So, yeah, I just really don't know. All I do know, and I'll stick to it, is the answer wouldn't have been to send those same, same men to France in 1915. I just think they would have got killed quicker. Mm -hmm. But, yeah. Uh, Clive, I'm going to wrap that up. It's 27 minutes past. I said we'd finish before half past nine, so I'll keep the promise. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, I've thoroughly enjoyed tonight's presentation and I'd invite everybody to do one final round of applause via the hands up routine using the button on on the Zoom technology just to thank Clive once again for his efforts tonight. And Clive, there's stacks and stacks of hands going up as a silent round of applause. So I've uh, I can, I can safely say everybody's thoroughly enjoyed that, um, and I know that you're very passionate about uh, about um, uh, Gallipoli, and that's certainly shone through um, tonight um, with uh, with your presentation. So um, the, the final thing is just to say that the next uh, presentation on Zoom will be on uh, the 9th of May, uh, when we're talking about analysing the enemy, Major James Cuff and Third Third Eep. So we'll be um, analysing the role of, in, of intelligence at, at Third Eap uh, with uh, Dr. Jim Beach, who, who will be uh, talking to us um, on the 9th of May. So if you're not registered already, please do so. Clive, 28 minutes past. I'm going to call it a night there. No and uh, thanks very much indeed uh, for your efforts. And everybody, thank you very much for supporting these webinars from the Western Front Association. I do hope you've enjoyed them. Thanks very much and good night. Good night. Mademoiselle from Armitage's Yeah.